Hi friends. Pete here with the evening devotion today. We'll be doing another prayer passage. This time we're going to look at Matthew 5 verses 21 to 25 as we continue through the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to read the passages a few pieces at a time today. And we're going to pray into each of the three. And today's passage is really about anger and reconciliation and dealing with challenges between us and other people. And I think it has a lot that's applicable to certainly community life, how we live together with each other, and also to how we behave as we're socially distanced and in our homes uh, for the foreseeable future. So, God, we just ask that you would meet us this evening, that you would come right now with the presence and love of your Holy Spirit, that you would be with us as we pray and read the Bible. And we ask, God, that you would use the words of Christ to set us even more free. Amen. So Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22 says, and this is Jesus teaching, You've heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. And if you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Now that's real strong language from Jesus. <laughs> and... What he's doing here, as he does quite often in the Sermon on the Mount, is taking Old Testament law that God really meant to change our hearts, and he's getting to the heart of the issue. And he's saying, sure, the Ten Commandments say don't commit murder, but even when you're angry to people, even when you're angry at someone, you're subject to judgment. And it doesn't say here who the judgment is from, God or people. This happens a few times in Scripture. And you know as well as I do, when you get really angry at someone, it becomes visible. You know, you have, <laughs> maybe not quite like that, but you make faces, you breathe differently, you might get louder. There's all kind of ways people can tell when you're angry at them. And that's a way people get offended pretty quickly, is when you get real angry at them. It, uh, it doesn't seem to help most of the time. And then he says, if you call someone an idiot, you might be brought before the court, but if you curse someone... You're in danger of the fires of hell. And so what Jesus is saying is that, sure, not committing murder is good. If you have not murdered anyone today, thumbs up. Nice job. But God actually cares about the condition of your heart, about being in a place where you're not quickly angry with people. There's a couple words for patience in the New Testament, and one of them is makrothumas, which means slow to anger, slow to boil over. And so Jesus is challenging us, don't just not commit murder, but don't want to commit murder. Don't get so angry with people that you get carried away. And don't make moral judgments on people. The interpretation I've heard for the difference between calling someone an idiot or saying to them, you fool, or cursing them, is that when we call people names, you know, we're subject to earthly authority. But when we make moral judgments on people, when we call them a moral fool, we're subject to the judgment of God because God says that's his job, not ours. And so what we see here is Jesus talking about anger and name calling and cursing. And I feel like uh, maybe Jesus has been looking into some homes during quarantine. I have three kids and I am confident that there have been bouts of anger and name calling and cursing in my home over the last couple of weeks. And so, what is Jesus asking of us here? He's asking us to be people who say no to that way of life and who welcome a different way of life. I think the antidote to this is peace and patience. And so what I'd like to do is consider your own heart and your own stress level, your own ways of coping. And how often have you become angry with people? How often have you spoken poorly to people or made moral judgments of people? And what I'd like to do is just lead us in a time of repentance where we say, God, um, here's where I've done these things and I'd like you to take that from me. I'd like you to let me give this to you and let it be your job. 
So I'll lead us as we pray. We'll have some silence for each of us to pray as the Holy Spirit meets us in the word. So Holy Spirit, come. We have been angry. We have called people names. We have made moral judgments against people. And we want to be tender to the words of Jesus. We ask that you would open our hearts to giving that way of life up. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would begin to change us and make us slow to anger like you are. The Bible says you're gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, Lord. Would you help us to receive your grace and compassion? And would you help us to become slow to anger? As we pray, just meet us in the places that we need you tonight, God. really love John Marsden's story as a young man uh, in ministry in the church and having a problem with anger and a couple guys from the church sitting him down and telling him it's not a good way to live and John saying I don't want to live that way and setting out on a new path. I think God has the answer to our anger and irritability and impatience. And I think that answer is found in Christ, the one who's challenging us to live that way in the first place. May the Holy Spirit meet you tonight and give you peace. Next are verses 23 and 24. Jesus says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. And so this all takes place in the book of Matthew, which is written to Jewish Christians. And this is worship language. Uh, offering God a sacrifice at the altar is the language of worshiping God. And what Jesus is saying here is that people holding something against you is more important than entering into worship of God. And if you know that's going on, if you know someone has something against you, stop worshiping God right away, even if you're just in the middle or just getting started and go, make it right, then come back and worship God. And I just think making amends quickly is a huge deal to Jesus and a huge deal in the Bible. And I want to lead us in prayer that we would treat relationships as worth as much as God does as worth as much as Jesus does. It's easy to have relationships be in a difficult place and maybe someone has something against us and to go on worshiping as if it's not there. The Minnesota way is to stuff those things down until they burst out at Thanksgiving or whenever. And Jesus is saying to have a clean slate with people insofar as it depends on you. And so I'd like to lead us in prayer that God would highlight for us anyone we need to be reconciled with. And one of the neat things about the season that we're in right now 
is if we reach out to someone in a safe and careful way electronically, that's to be expected because we're all in isolation anyway. And so I think some of the safer ways to begin attempts at reconciliation and making things right are more socially acceptable right now than ever. And so I want to encourage you, if God puts someone on your heart as we pray, take a step after we're done with the devotion and reach out. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would call to mind anybody we know has something against us and that you would help us to set the record straight as much as we are able. We know, God, some of our relationships we can't fix. Some of our relationships we've worked on as best we can, and there's not a bridge yet. But for, you know, stuff that we haven't worked on, God, would you show us how we can take steps to be at peace with people? Be with us as we pray, God. There's another well-known passage of scripture that says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I can think of a couple times in my history in the church, uh, specifically where I thought someone had something against me, but I couldn't tell what it was. And instead of going to people, I tried really hard to figure it out, like why and what can I do about that? And, you know, bounce it off another friend or pastor, like, think this person might have something against me, but I don't know if it's fixable and, and strategize and take too long and not go deal with something. And I really regret the times that I have suspected something's wrong and not been the one to go fix it. And once it led to a relationship that never got fully repaired, you know, with someone who I really respect and care about, but I think just didn't reach out to in time, and by the time I did, I was all stuck and twisted in my own interpretations of reality, you know? And so I hope God will give you freedom to be reconciled to anybody who comes to mind, and I hope God will have mercy on all of us and help me do the same. Our last passage is verses 25 and 26, and this is Jesus still teaching in the same vein. He says, when you're on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you'll be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free until you have paid the last penny. And, uh, you know, the legal system is not the same as it was in Jesus's time now. In Jesus's time, court was handled by testimony. There wasn't you know, DNA testing and evidentiary hearings and psychological experts. It was one person's word against another. And that's very often how life is. Uh, you know, maybe no one can prove what you've done, uh, but maybe someone knows. And what it's saying here is instead of going to a higher authority and arguing and fighting when you've been in the wrong, just settle your differences and admit it. This is a case where you're the one standing accused. And instead of fighting and protecting yourself and refusing to admit things because they can't be proven, just settle your differences quickly. 
And I think this is real applicable, even without the same court system of Christ's time. When someone's implying that you've done something wrong, and maybe you have, and maybe it can't be proven, are you willing to just accept it and apologize? I think what Jesus is challenging us to hear is accept when we've done wrong and admit it and accept the consequences. I think of a time, I think in the first year that I was associate pastor at River Heights Vineyard and, uh, you know, one of the pastors had preached quite a bit over our allotted amount of time a couple weeks in a row and then went on a trip and I wound up, I think, doing announcements. And in announcements, I referenced like, hey, I think the sermon will be shorter this week. And I think I did it in a way that wasn't entirely honorable. And when he got back in town, my boss sat me down and said, I heard you had something to say, you know, during announcements that didn't sound entirely honoring. And I thought, oh, no. That's not who I want to be and how I want to act. And I apologized. And maybe 12 years later, <laughs> my boss told me that that was a real big moment in him trusting me. And that, you know, he thought we might not be able to keep working together as a result of him talking to me about this. And I just think if I wasn't able to Admit when I'm wrong, how much would I have missed out on there? And how much have I missed out on times when I wasn't able to admit I was wrong? And so what I'd like to pray is that God would grow us in being able to admit when we're wrong and accept the consequences and then be forgiven and clean. That's the neat thing in Christianity is that when we repent, we are forgiven immediately, always, covered by Christ's work. And so there's no like spiritual penalty to admitting our failures, we're forgiven that by Christ. And so, Jesus, I ask you, would you help all of us to accept when we've done wrong, to admit it, to take the consequences, and then to know we're free and clear? Be with us as we pray, God. So as we prayed, I asked, you know, God to kind of speak to me about how I'm doing with accepting when I've done wrong and taking the consequences and then being free and clear. And I felt some peace about that. And then God pointed out when people get upset at me and I feel like the reason they're upset at me is unjust, I do not let go as easily. I always want people to admit yeah, I was wrong to get upset at you as if, <laughs> I mean, that's not very smart on my part and it doesn't work out very well most of the time, but that's a thing that's in my heart sometimes. And I felt like God was saying, you know, when people have done wrong, uh, let them get to the free and clear and let me handle it. And so I think really a lot of what Jesus is saying in this passage is that, you know, the Old Testament law about not murdering each other is great, but God wants to come into our lives all the way down into our heart. He wants to set us free from the kind of anger that leads to murder. He wants to set us free from, 
being people who dodge responsibility, people who, you know, want to go worship God, but don't want to make things right with other people. And so I think there's a lot of beauty in this passage for us as a community. As we work these things out long and slow, wherever you are on the journey, we get to be a people who learn how to do this over time. And one day we're going to get there and we're going to get to do this forever. I love you, friends. May God bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you. May, may God be gracious to you and give you peace now and forevermore. I miss you. I can't wait to be together. Hopefully soon. God willing. Goodbye, friends.